we continue the lectures about the hyperplastic breast changes or NDs by talking about one of the most frequently occurring hyperplastic proliferated breast changes, fibroadenoma. We have discussed the fibrocystic change, which causes a considerable differential diagnostic problem for the radiologist, but in that hyperplastic breast change, it was the excess amount of fluid that led to the formation of cysts, calcifications within the cysts, and we detailed how to solve this problem. Fibroadenoma is one of the hyperplastic breast changes. We have one of the basic tissue components, the fibrous tissue that proliferates. When we look at the conventional histology, as well as the three-dimensional histology of a fibroadenoma, we see this extreme amount of intralobular connective tissue. The 3D histology image is very telling. All this yellow is the enormous amount of fibrous tissue that proliferated. So if you look at the tiny TDLU that used to measure 1 to 2 millimeter in size, and the SNI are outlined here with the white lines, but among them there is a very important functional intralobular connective tissue. Whenever this proliferates to the extreme, then we got a tumor. But this is a benign lesion where the fibrosis dominates the picture. And when the Latin connects two words, then the end of the first word is O. But this originates from the glandular tissue. So now we understand the name, the fibrosis dominates the picture, originates from the glandular tissue and forms a tumor. Now, this tumor formation explains why the radiologist may have a differential diagnostic problem. Because the fibroadenomas always oval-shaped circular, very often lobulated. We see these microlobulations. And also, these develop in the breasts of younger women who have dense fibroglandular tissue surrounding the fibroadenoma. And partly the aging fibroadenoma is getting ill-defined because it shrinks, and partly there is the overlapping fibroglandular tissue that does not allow us to analyze the contour properly. We have to use multimodality approach in order to arrive at the correct diagnosis. And in my opinion, it is much easier to establish the final diagnosis of a fibroadenoma than many of the other hyperplastic breast changes, especially now when we have ultrasound-guided 14-gauge core biopsy, which certainly provides sufficient amount of tissue for the pathologist to tell us that we are talking about a very simple non-calcified fibroadenoma. This would be differential diagnostic problem number one. Differential diagnostic problem number two is when it starts to calcify. The aging fibroadenoma is hyalinizing, and in that hyalinized tissue, calcifications may be formed. And fortunately, there are two kinds of calcifications. One of them, causing no differential diagnostic problem whatsoever, is when within the fibroadenoma, the calcification looks like popcorn, huge, coarse, very high density, even in density, smooth contoured. The problem arises when the calcifications look like the calcifications in grade 2 in cytocarcinoma. Cluster, irregular, tightly packed, discernible calcifications are actually competing in the differential diagnosis, especially when the soft tissue involutes and the calcifications are standing alone, cluster or multiple cluster. But once again, this should not cause a very big problem today when we have the ultrasound examination and the 14-gauge core biopsy hand-eye coordination provides sufficient amount of tissue for the pathologist to establish the final histologic diagnosis. Demonstrating the place of the fibroadenoma among all the hyperplastic breast changes, we have already talked about the fibrocystic change. Here is the fibroadenoma that is shrinking and results in ill-defined contour. And here are the calcifications that cause differential diagnostic problem, the crushed stone-like calcifications.
Dear colleagues, when we talk about one of the differential diagnostic problems, that is circular oval lesions with or without associated calcifications, fibroadenoma takes a leading role, especially in younger women. And this is a statistics about all those circular lesions that have been sent to surgical biopsy, not because we could not establish the preoperative microscopic diagnosis, but because of patient preference. Quite many times, patients want to have the obvious pathologic lesion removed from their breast. We are going to see another pie chart when fibroadenoma, partially calcified, is causing differential diagnostic problem. There, it is fibrocystic change that is on the first place, and fibroadenoma is on the second. Let us look at the natural history of fibroadenoma. It originates in women's breasts around the age of 18 to 22, anyway under the age of 30. It results in a convex contour because it's an excess amount of tissue. Many times it is lobulated and it grows. It keeps growing and growing benign lesions might have a so-called halo sign. It is usually partial. The problem is that it is a very dense fibroglandular tissue that surrounds them and they are not even going to be detected. So they are left in the breast for about 20 years. And when we invite women at age 40 to breast cancer screening, then the fibroadenoma already shrinks and it is ill-defined. And although low density, we must think about carcinoma developing in that breast. So we have a diagnostic problem. But we can solve the diagnostic problem by using the ultrasound-guided core biopsy. Later on, it can calcify, and that calcification either does not or does cause differential diagnostic problem for us. But we can solve all this problem by using the multi-modality approach. It is not always easy. I'm showing the mammogram. I'm showing the ultrasound and then the histology of two entirely different circular lobulated lesions of about equal size. Here's the mammogram of another lesion. Here's the ultrasound and then the histology. Both of them are partially hidden within the surrounding dense fibrogranular tissue. The ultrasound image does not differ significantly. However, one of them is a medullary carcinoma, the other one is a fibroadenoma. So spot compression is going to be one of the tools we are going to use in order to spread the superimposed parenchyma away from the circular lesion, benign or malignant, in order to judge the contour. But many times, medullary carcinoma is more sharply outlined than a shrinking fibroadenoma. Then we use ultrasound. Unfortunately, many times it is extremely difficult to distinguish fibroadenoma from medullary carcinoma by only looking at ultrasound examination. It is indeed ultrasound-guided preoperative needle biopsy that is going to establish the preoperative microscopic diagnosis, and then we can plan proper patient management. Let's practice looking at non-calcified circular oval-shaped lesion, solitary, surrounded by fibroglandular tissue. We cannot see the contour properly not even on the spot magnification images. So we need the ultrasound examination, which is really a gut scent in fibroadenoma because it exquisitely shows this wider than tall oval-shaped lesion with the information gathered from mammography. That is, it's a fairly low-density lesion, which also has a partial halo sign. The mammographic diagnosis is very insecure but the ultrasound examination provides further information, and then we plan 14-gauge core biopsy that establishes the diagnosis. Another example on an asymptomatic woman who came to screening examination. Centrally located within the breast, there is a solitary oval-shaped lesion. We cannot judge the contour properly. This is the area where we don't like pathologic lesions with, with convex contour occur, this is the so-called no man's land, the retroglandular clear space. The certain percentage of the breast cancers are localized here. 
So we have to work up the case, use spot compression, magnification, and that actually didn't help at all because now we have a highly suspicious, ill-defined, solitary, although low-density lesion on both magnification projections. We perform ultrasound, and in this case, not even that helped. And then we turn to an other adjunctive tool, 14-gauge core biopsy, on the ultrasound guidance that is going to show that we are dealing with a benign fiber adenoma. Low-density radiopic lesion may be partly sharply outlined, partly ill-defined, or superimposed by the surrounding fibroglandular tissue. It could be a cyst. It could be a fiber adenoma. It could be a larger papilloma, but it could be a cancer as well. Out of the cancers, I only think about either papillary carcinoma or mucinous carcinoma because we can see parenchymal elements and vessels superimposed. The statistical chance that we are looking at a benign lesion is much higher than looking at a carcinoma. Ultrasound examination suggests that this is a wider than tall lesion, so now we can put the core biopsy into the lesion and then we have a perfect microscopic diagnosis. And that information can be shared with the patient because this fiber adenoma is actually 15 to 20 years old. Could carcinoma occur within a fiber adenoma? Because of the entrapped acini, which certainly have normal epithelial cell layer. The answer is yes. Does it happen often? No. It happens actually much less frequently than in radial scar or in connection with sclerosing adenosis or in connection with fibrocystic change. And also, when it happens, then in 50% of the cases, we are talking about lobular carcinoma in situ, which we radiologists cannot see. It may happen that it's in situ carcinoma. Most of the times, low-grade in situ carcinoma. Or it may happen that we are seeing a stellate lesion associated with growing out of a fiber adenoma. Here is an example. At the ominous area where most of the breast cancers occur, we see a low-density lesion with the convex contour. All the other contours of the fibroglandular tissue are concave. This calls our attention for the necessity of working up the case. The patient is called back from screening for further workup. We magnify. We use spot compression and magnification. And obviously, in that ominous area where most of the cancers are found, we see a low-density lesion, but it is very ill-defined. Then there is a suspicion for looking at a malignant lesion. 14-gauge core biopsy can be performed either by using stereotactic guidance or ultrasound guidance. Obviously, ultrasound-guided core biopsy is much easier. And then the pathologist says, yes, indeed, we are looking at a fiber adenoma within which both inside to so-called ductal and inside to lobular carcinoma can be seen. So then we refer the patient to surgical biopsy. The lesion has been removed with very good margin. And here we see the final histology, low-grade in situ carcinoma, as well as lobular carcinoma in situ localized within a fiber adenoma. Could we have made this diagnosis preoperatively just by looking at the imaging? The answer is no. We had to use intervention. Now let us talk about the fiber adenomas within which calcification is formed. The easy group of these cases is when the calcifications are huge, coarse, very high density, very even in density, extremely sharply outlined. The individual calcifications look like popcorn. These lesions, especially when they are localized close to the skin, are easy to palpate. This is a firm accumulation of hyalinized fibrous tissue. Therefore, at palpation, this is going to be very hard. In addition, there are these bony elements in it. So the physical examiner must experience these as suspicious for malignancy, not because they involve the skin, 
but because they are very hard upon palpation. But then the mammographic examination is a godsend. We do not even need to perform ultrasound-guided percutaneous biopsies in these cases. The diagnosis is so sure. When screening asymptomatic women in a population, we come across these cases very often. A special subgroup of these calcifications is the eggshell-like calcification. Whenever we see eggshell-like calcifications on a mammogram, it is very important to ask the question, what is the density in the central portion? If it's radiolucent, then we talk about partially calcified oil cyst. If it is radio-opaque, and we see these coarse eggshell-like calcifications, then we talk about fibroadenoma. One more example of coarse calcification within an aging fibroadenoma. When we establish the microscopic diagnosis by using larger bore needle biopsy, and the diagnosis is fibroadenoma, and the woman receives proper information, she might make a decision of not going through surgical intervention. In that case, we have the opportunity of studying the natural history of the aging fibroadenoma. As we see, the soft tissue shrinks, the calcifications are getting more and more expressed, more obvious, and year after year, or decade after decade, we can observe what's going to happen with the aging fibroadenoma. Less soft tissue, more calcium, harder at palpation. Just looking at the mammograms, you make the correct diagnosis. But there always is a trick. Let's think carefully when analyzing this case. This is a 68-year-old woman who felt a lump for three months. If we make the quick diagnosis that this is a lobulated, partially calcified old fibroadenoma, then you can ask the question, why did this 68-year-old woman felt this huge lesion only for three months? This fibroadenoma must have been in her breast for about 50 years. It must have been formed when she was 18. Why didn't she feel this lesion for 50 years? Why does she come now and presents with the lesion? We have to be very careful. We palpate, and we palpate what she points out. That didn't bring us closer to the final diagnosis. Then you might ask the technologist to use spot compression. Let me see the contour. It is extremely sharply outlined here, extremely sharply outlined here. What do we see here? some architectural distortion. Let's look at the next picture. Yes, indeed, there is an architectural distortion there. And then you ask the question, is it a carcinoma that develops from that portion of the fibroadenoma? The answer is yes. Histologic examination shows that there is an invasive carcinoma that is responsible for the palpatory finding. Now we discuss the fibroadenoma with multiple cluster or solitary cluster discernible calcification that is competing in the differential diagnosis with grade 2 in cytocarcinoma that is localized within the terminal ductal lobular unit. In these cases, the most frequent troublemaker is fibrocystic change. Fibroadenoma is on the second place, and then the third hyperplastic breast change that may show up on a mammogram as discernible calcifications in a cluster and the calcifications are irregular in size and shape and density is papilloma. What happens within the TDLU when fibroadenoma is formed? We talked about the excess amount of fibrous tissue proliferating. Within that hyalinized fibrous tissue these individual calcifications with different size, form, and shape may occur. But interestingly enough, and this might help you sometimes, the calcifications are pretty far away from each other because 
the proliferating fibrous tissue pushes them apart. In grade 2 in cytocarcinoma, the calcifications are shoulder to shoulder. The whole distended TDLU measures about 3 mm in this case. So we can understand that the cancerous SNI are extremely close to each other, so the associated calcification is going to be very close to each other. Here is an example of a fibroadenoma within which we see malignant type calcifications and that turns out to be in situ carcinoma within a fibroadenoma. Here we see a very low density lesion. We can see parenchymal elements, fibrostrands, veins superimposed. It may give the impression that this is going to be a benign lesion but it's fairly ill-defined. So we can think about a mucinous carcinoma or we can think about a fibroadenoma. Mucinous carcinomas may contain calcifications, but those are the powdery, some body-like calcifications. These are coarse, high density. The educated guess based on imaging finding is that this could be a partially calcified fibroadenoma. So then we use the multimodality approach. 14 gauge core biopsy under ultrasound guidance. The imager is in a more difficult situation in this case because if we think about fibroadenoma, then where is the soft tissue? It might have disappeared, it might have been involuted, and unfortunately, the calcifications are too close to each other, just like in cancer in situ. They are irregular in form and density. Larger bore needle biopsy establishes a diagnosis easily. Histologic diagnosis, partially calcified fibroadenoma. Partially calcified fibroadenoma in this case as well. Can we make the diagnosis just by looking at the mammographic image? No. We need intervention. Just like in this case. The calcifications are clustered irregular, suspicious for malignancy, and there is a partly sharply outlined and partly ill-defined low-density lesion. We do need preoperative intervention. Both of them are histologically confirmed fibroadenomas. Here we should not speculate about the diagnosis just by looking at the picture. First, we have to work up the case. And this is the spot compression microfocus magnification. Now we know that this tumor mass is a low density lesion. We can see superimposed parenchymal elements, and it has these benign type calcifications. Once again, I would perform core biopsy, and then we can inform the patient about the finding. Similar cases, although the calcifications may look irregular somewhat varying in density, surrounded by an ill-defined low-density lesion. The best approach is perform ultrasound-guided larger bore needle biopsy. Like in this case, here is a surgery because the patient asked for it. Now we can see where the calcifications are localized. There is actually apocrine metaplasia here within these cystic cavities, produces fluid and some of the calcifications are within these cystic cavities. Now we arrive at cases that are mission impossible. There is no surrounding tumor mass. The calcifications are so irregular, so clustered, that the radiologist must be suspicious about looking at malignant lesions. These are already spot compression, microfocus magnification images. We perform core biopsy, and then the pathologist says this is a partially calcified fibroadenoma. It is very important to understand that the calcifications, as well as the extreme proliferation of the fibrosis, are shoulder to shoulder. So when we use the larger bore needle biopsy and we get the calcifications, we should trust the histopathologic diagnosis. This is valid in fibrocystic change and also in papilloma case as well. Sometimes, however, you just experience tremendous discrepancy between the mammographic finding and the microscopic diagnosis. In this case, we see the sentinel node. 
and calcifications without associated tumors. Microfocus magnification of this region confirms that these are cluster, tightly packed calcifications, irregular in size and density. We think that it might be grade 2 in situ carcinoma we face. Here are additional images confirming the suspicion of looking at malignant lesion. Then we performed 14 gauge core biopsy. Histologic diagnosis clearly shows partially calcified fibroadenoma. Then you go back to the mammogram and you experience a discrepancy. Actually, we should have trusted histopathology. We didn't, so the patient was sent to surgical biopsy. Already at this time point, we might think that, yes, indeed, these are going to be fibroadenomas. The histologic diagnosis confirms nearly entirely hyalinized, partially calcified fibroadenomas. Dear colleagues, this case carries the teaching point I was just outlining. That is, there is an intimate relationship between the pathologic process that produces the calcifications as well as the calcifications. So when the larger bore needle biopsy provides sufficient amount of calcifications for histologic examination and the histology shows fibroadenoma or grade 2 in situ or fibrocystic change, we should trust the histopathology examination. And so we can avoid unnecessary surgical biopsies.